I'm going to speak about bilingualism and creativity and particularly I'm going to focus on uh, the effects of bilingual experiences in interpreters and translators on uh, cognitive control and creativity. Uh, so uh, Theo has already introduced me, uh, uh, so it's, there's no need to add anything to that because he was very precise and uh, um, we can come directly to uh, the content of this presentation. So today I'm going to speak about bilingualism, creativity and also uh, other variables which are uh, influencing uh, bilingualism and creativity. Uh, which come both to uh, the list of bilingual experiences, but also uh, individual uh, differences. Uh, in my study, uh, I will focus on the uh, individual bilingual differences in a professional bilinguals, and by that I mean interpreters and translators, comparing them to non-professional bilinguals. From now on, if I use uh, the term bilinguals, I will refer to the non-professional ones and uh, I will refer to interpreters and translators, either by these uh, names or by professional bilinguals. Uh, at the end, I will discuss my result and uh, conclusions, and also I will um, give it a thought uh, in terms of uh, what further research might bring and also discuss some limitations of my research. So um, if you are speaking about bilingualism and creativity, why right, these two concepts are connected. So first of all, research has shown that bilinguals are more creative than monolinguals. This has been ascribed to various individual differences uh, and uh, bilingual experiences, which are thought to influence creativity, but the mechanisms of uh, this relationship are still poorly understood. The, advent the creative advantage in bilinguals has been linked to modulation in executive function in bilinguals. But if we mention executive functions in bilinguals, we need to add also that there is a controversy about uh, executive functioning in bilinguals as not all previous research has came to the same results. And by that, I mean uh, the cognitive advantage in bilinguals. Uh, last but not least, the effects of being a professional bilingual on creativity are heavily understudied. So first of all, it's necessary to uh, explain what creativity is. Really concise but exact definition uh, of creativity is that it's a production of novel and useful ideas. And we can uh, think about creativity as consisting of two basic thinking processes. Divergent thinking, which refers to the ability to generate novel ideas and be fluent in idea generation and convergent thinking, which is a synthesis of ideas. And the convergent thinking serves as a evaluation process to choose the appropriate uh, ideas from the many which we, which we had. So uh, we can link also the two adjectives, novel to the divergent thinking and useful products in creativity to convergent thinking. If I uh, explain it by uh, uh, what thinking processes in general are necessary for creativity. During creative thinking, we need to mind wonder to uh, be able to generate a lot of new ideas. But not all, of, not all of our ideas are relevant. So we also need attention to control for uh, our thoughts and to choose which among the ideas which we had are uh, the most relevant, the most useful to solve uh, the presented problems. The third thing necessary for creativity is switching because we need to continuously switch between the mind wandering and between the attention until we find the best idea. Uh, it has been shown that there is a, a list of individual differences which influence creativity as gender. Females have been shown to be more creative than males. Intelligence, uh, this is because intelligence and creativity are uh, overlapping concepts. So higher IQ scores 
uh, lead to a higher creativity scores. There are also some uh, genetic correlates and also education and socioeconomic status are of importance uh, when speaking about creativity. So if we sum up what's been said uh, about creativity so far, it's a product of a general recognition because several thinking processes converge and give rise to creativity. And uh, these are a combination of uh, novel ideas. We need attention and we need to switch between, uh, between these thinking processes. From this follows that everybody is creative, uh, but uh, as a result of enhanced uh, executive functions which underlie creativity, some people are more creative than others. And example of these people are bilinguals. So uh, let's uh, zoom in uh, what classifies bilinguals in terms of uh, giving them this uh, creativity advantage. Uh, bilinguals need to solve everyday competition between their languages to communicate successfully. This is uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, both of their languages are activated in parallel. They need to use uh, executive functions to choose uh, between these languages which are competing in their minds and it strains these executive functions. And uh, this also gives rise to the executive functioning enhancement as some of the research has shown. Uh, but this is not something which holds just, uh, which is linked just to the fact that someone speaks or doesn't speak two languages because the ways how bilinguals use their languages also differ and the various ways how we can use our languages also pose different demands on our executive functions. One of the uh, important factors in shaping executive functioning bilinguals is interactional context. According to adaptive control hypothesis uh, from Abu Talbi and Green, uh, there are three interactional contexts based on how bilinguals use their languages. In the single language context, one person uses one language for each environment, at work, at home, uh, or at school. In the dual language context, one person uses uh, one language uh, in uh, two different languages in one environment or for different topics or for different interlocutors. So it requires much more uh, attention for the user to choose between the languages. In the dense code switching, uh, this refers to the environment when the uh, bilinguals can switch freely between the two languages and mix them even in one sentence or paragraph. So if we look at the executive functions linked to all of these environments, the single language context requires inhibition. Dual language context is the one which is assumed to pose the highest demands on uh, executive functioning. Uh, and that's inhibition switching and monitoring and dense code switching context requires only opportunistic planning. This is uh, what comes most readily in hand. Um, when, we are speaking, when we are speaking about code switching, uh, several, this is uh, the uh, act uh, which refers to uh, alternating between languages within one sentence or paragraph. The way how we alternate uh, between the languages also poses different cognitive demands. And uh, we can uh, see that, for example, in uh, code switching example where we separate both languages and it's possible to divide this sentence in two, one entire English and one entire Czech sentence. Uh, there is uh, inhibition in play when we need to inhibit or switching in play when we need to switch to the other language. And when both languages are highly co-activated, as you can see in this example of code switching, when we switch, uh, when we intervene both uh, languages in one sentence, this requires opportunistic planning and to some research also conflict monitoring. So not inhibition because both languages are working in cooperation. Um, and when we are speaking about effects of bilingualism on, on executive functioning, it is also important to realize that these effects are moderated uh, by uh, 
the uh, level of engagement with which the violin was engaged in violin, in, a, in their bilingual behavior. So this is necessary, it follows that it is necessary to take into account the level of immersion uh, in bilingual behavior. This uh, examples of, uh, of uh, variables linked to uh, bilingual immersion are uh, social language use, the extent uh, when people use languages at home, L2 proficiency, number of languages we know, et cetera. Then also uh, using language for professional purposes as for interpreting or translating poses different demands than if we are using language uh, in everyday life for leisure purposes. So uh, here we can see that translators and interpreters uh, are examples of professional bilinguals. And even between them, we can expect some differences in terms of the cognitive demands, demands posed on them by their language use. So both of them come from the dual language context, the high de cognitively demanding context. Both of them need to have a language high language proficiency, a high level of engagement in L1, L2, but now we come to differences uh, due to the time pressure interpreters have higher cognitive demands and also uh, the Lang L1 overlaps in interpreters with the L2 much considerably more than in translators. This is uh, it, this has been shown to cause also differences in executive functions between these two groups in terms of processing speeds, inhibition, working memory, and updating. So if we uh, link these things together, uh, bilingualism and creativity, we arrived to uh, the creative advantage in the bilinguals, and it has been explained by three uh, ways. First of all, it's uh, the creative cultural enrichment, which uh, has been used as an explanation for why bilinguals are more creative, because bilinguals uh, have more uh, stimuli from different cultures. Uh, they have also richer conceptual and semantic networks because they work with two sets of con uh, semantic networks compared to monolinguals. And then uh, the most important thing for the current study uh, is that uh, they have enhanced cognitive processes underlying creativity coming from the various bilingual experiences. Uh, I hope I have shown that it's necessary to control for individual experiences in bilinguals in terms of uh, cognitive demands, but this is also necessary uh, to control for in terms of uh, creativity. To sum up in the schema, how bilingualism and creativity merges, uh, we have seen that uh, bilinguals need to mind wander to uh, be have an open mind to be open for stimuli for several cultures. They need attention and executive functioning to choose uh, between the two languages which are the most useful at the given moment. And also they need to switch between the languages and their cultural identities. So if you remember the schema for creativity, here we can see that bilinguals are assumedly trained in similar uh, thinking processes as required for creativity. Uh, here we uh, depart to the uh, individual differences in bilinguals which are thought to influence creativity. So uh, it, 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 it has been shown that uh, language proficiency is of an importance. Uh, gains in proficiency come with losses in divergent thinking. Divergent thinking is the ability to produce a lot of ideas. So highly Proficient bilinguals are worse in divergent thinking, but are better in the convergent thinking. This is the synthesis of the ideas. Also, when it comes to the professional bilinguals, it has been shown that interpreters score lower on divergent thinking than uh, 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 regular bilinguals with short interpreting training. This is again possibly because uh, they have this unprecedented cognitive control training, which is linked to their professional bilingualism. Uh, last but not least, code switching has been also uh, shown to influence creativity. And as you can remember, uh, code switching is uh, uh, connected to opportunistic planning when uh, both languages are mixed uh, within one sentence or paragraph. And this 
is considered itself a creative language act. It has been shown that code switchers uh, are better in the divergent thinking compared to uh, bilinguals who don't code switch that often. This might be due to the training in mixing and combining the words within one sentence or paragraph. So uh, this is uh, for the uh, introduction to this topic. And now we uh, come to my, uh, the, to the current study. So the aims of the study is to clarify the relationship between bilingualism and creative thinking. And I will focus on individual differences and bilingual experiences, which has been shown in previous research to influence both creativity or bilingualism. We will keep the language pair and culture constant to uh, lower the chance that the cultural enrichment and the semantic networks will play a role in our data. So by this, we will ensure that we will concentrate on the effect of executive functioning advantage or enhancement in bilinguals on creativity. The novelty of this research is uh, the uh, large number of bilingual ex background measures uh, and also that we are investigating a highly understudied group of professional bilinguals and comparing them to non-professional bilinguals in terms of their creative abilities. The hypotheses are as follows. So um, convergent thinking, which is the synthesis of the ideas, poses uh, higher demands on executive functioning. So we expect that bilinguals who engage in behavior, which poses higher demands on uh, language separation and is linked to inhibition, they'll have convergent thinking advantage. You can see, you can um, conceptualize it as bilingualism, uh, which poses high demands, cognitive demands, trains our executive functioning, and in turn, this gives rise to better convergent thinking scores. Uh, in terms of uh, more concrete hypotheses, we expect in terms of group differences that interpreters will have the best, uh, uh, will score uh, better on convergent thinking than translators, and these will score better than bilinguals. We use this, uh, uh, we expect this based on the, that interpreters and translators are highly engaged in dual language context and uh, therefore they have higher cognitive demands. Uh, they are trained in their executive functions better than bilinguals. We also expect based on a, a secondary literature that variables which are going to be positively associated with convergent thinking on the individual level are uh, the engagement in dual and uh, single language context, high levels of LG proficiency, involvement in uh, some type of code switching, intelligence, and performance on uh, um, inhibitory control task, a flanker task. For the divergent thinking, which is the ability to uh, come with a lot of ideas and is one of the uh, basic uh, processes, uh, thinking processes uh, of creativity, uh, this uh, divergent thinking requires less restricted mind and also lower uh, executive functioning demands. So we think that better executive functioning, uh, or it has been shown that better executive functioning comes with losses uh, on uh, divergent thinking. Therefore, we expect that bilinguals who engage in behavior which is marked by language mixing and switching will have divergent thinking advantage. The predictions for groups for divergent thinking is the exact opposite than for the uh, convergent thinking. So bilinguals are going to be better than translators and these are going to be better than interpreters. And again, this is because interpreters are going to be taxed uh, by their uh, better, uh, relatively better um, cognitive uh, ability, uh, executive functioning abilities. Variables associated positively with divergent thinking on individual level are expected to be involvement in a dense code switching context. This is this context where languages are mixed, 
involvement in some type of uh, code switching uh, uh, where languages are mixed, again, intelligence, and also lower performance on executive functioning tasks. In our study, we uh, measured uh, 114 uh, native Czech speakers and we divided uh, uh, from, coming from three different bilingual groups. First groups were uh, Czech English bilinguals without professional experience and then we had Czech English interpreters and Czech English translators. The uh, inclusion criteria included uh, um, the same socioeconomic status and all were right-handed both male and females. Uh, they uh, needed to report that they engage in English uh, at least two uh, uh, days a week and uh, also no history of neurological impairments. As for the uh, tasks, uh, we used a creativity task for divergent thinking, uh, the abbreviated drawings of creative thinking, which consists of one verbal task uh, where participants are asked to list as many problems they would encounter where they can where, when they could fly so because you can see this steps into the idea generation and also they were asked to complete uh, and complete pictures in creative ways to tell a complete story here is an example of uh, uh, a uh, filled in uh, creativity test uh, um, from, from our study. And I like especially this one, as you can see the incomplete picture, this is called the quietness before storm. And uh, I like that the participant here combined actually both of the incomplete pictures to create one uh, story together. So just to uh, give you an idea how it looks like. The convergent thinking was measured by uh, a, a remote associate test, a commonly used test. Uh, uh, this uh, test is based on a seemingly unrelated word triplets and participants uh, have to find a fourth word that ties the other three words together, calling actors dust and the word which ties them together is star. It was a Czech version of this test. Uh, the other task consisted of a uh, uh, English proficiency lexicon decision task to measure uh, uh, English proficiency. Uh, then also language social background questionnaire, which uh, uh, tapped into the uh, bilingual experience and immersion. So uh, level how to what extent people use their languages at, uh, during in different contexts and during various activities. Um, and uh, to measure intelligence, which uh, is important for creativity, we used four subtests from uh, Wexler Adults Intelligence Scale uh, for adults. To measure executive functioning, we used the uh, flanker task, which is a, a measure of inhibitory control. It consists of five arrows. Each trial consists of five arrows and participants need to concentrate on the middle arrow. Uh, and uh, there are two types of conditions, congruent and incongruent. In the congruent uh, condition, all arrows are pointing to the same direction as the middle one. In the incongruent, the flanking arrows, the destructors are pointing to the different direction than, uh, than the middle arrow. The incongruent condition requires uh, longer uh, reaction times because uh, of the destruction, it's more difficult to um, complete the task successfully. And the difference between the reaction time on incongruent and congruent trials, it is called the flanker effect, which is an index of the inhibitory control. The smaller the effect, the less problem the, ex the participant experiences in terms of the inhibitory control. Uh, to measure the code switching, we uh, used uh, code switching frequency uh, judgment task where uh, sentences with various type of code switching uh, were uh, presented on the screen uh, while also uh, the auditory uh, tape of these sentences was played. And the task of the participants was to rate these sentences on the, based on the frequency with which they would encounter similar utterances in everyday life. So it was a sliding uh, scale. 
uh, the whole procedure con uh, consists uh, took uh, about uh, three hours and first uh, Part of the participants at first, the behavioral measures, uh, which took two hours in total. Part of the participants had the scanning pr procedure because the flanker task was conducted in the MRI scanner. Uh, altogether, the scanning procedure and the MRI scanner took about 60 minutes. Uh, I won't speak about the data uh, from uh, the, the, the brain data uh, today, but stay tuned. Uh, once we have uh, analyzed the data, you can be looking forward uh, to uh, hopefully a nice talk also on the uh, neural correlates. Uh, the flanker task, we uh, applied um, a little bit of the data cleaning. So we had, uh, uh, we, we cleaned the trials, uh, which uh, were shorter than 200 milliseconds, which is just two trials. And also uh, because of the scanning, uh, because the flanker task was conducted in the scanner, we had a conservative upper limit uh, of 900 milliseconds. Uh, so after the 900 milliseconds, the flanker task wasn't measured anymore. So participants really needed to solve the flanker task within this. Uh, amount of time, uh, yet uh, it was it didn't lead to this. Uh, this uh, we didn't need to discard many uh, trials. Just one hundred eighty two, uh, just one, just two hundred forty seven trials out of uh, almost uh, thirty two thousand were discarded, which is three percent of the trials. So our error rate is three percent. And now we come to the uh, most uh, interesting or exciting part to uh, the results. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, present uh, uh, group differences. So um, we conducted ANCOVA with group uh, uh, as independent variable and age, a gender and uh, uh, age and gender as uh, covariates. And uh, as you can see, intelligent uh, yielded significant results. Bilinguals uh, are, uh, have significantly lower intelligence score than interpreters. Uh, also in uh, code switching frequency, the bilingual and interpreting group differed uh, significantly from each other. Uh, in terms of the flanker effect, which was the measure of inhibitory control, uh, we found uh, the first ANCOVA yielded significant results, but then, then the pairwise comparison, uh, the post hoc, didn't uh, show any uh, significant uh, differences between the groups. Uh, language proficiency showed that both bilingual uh, uh, translators and interpreters, so professional bilinguals, differ significantly from bilinguals. And as you can see, the trend of bilinguals uh, of translators being more alike interpreters is ongoing all around the place. The LSB was the measure of the bilingual immersion and it has uh, uh, one composite score uh, which uh, uh, yielded, uh, which not yielded uh, significant results. I'm sorry for this typo. Uh, but then if we looked at the um, social language use and uh, use of home, uh, we found that um, the groups differed in terms of how much they use their languages at home. As you can see, the scores are negative, which shows that all the groups actually don't use both of the languages at home often, but still the interpreters use uh, English um, home more than the regular bilinguals. So this is for the uh, differences between uh, the groups on the background measures. And now to the creativity measure the key, key dependent variables. As for, as for the divergent thinking task, we observed uh, significant differences between bilinguals and translators and also bilinguals and interpreters, showing that interpreters are the most uh, uh, graded ones in terms of divergent thinking, followed by translators and uh, bilinguals differ significantly from both of these 
uh, groups. The covariates here were age, gender, and intelligence. These covariates were included based on the previous research, which has shown that these uh, variables are important for creativity scores. Uh, the measures of uh, convergent thinking didn't yield, uh, the ANCOVA uh, didn't yield any significant results uh, a comparison between uh, the group. There weren't any significant differences between uh, any of the groups, but as you can see by uh, visual inspection, there are some trends, but um, there's nothing sig uh, statistic from the uh, statistical perspective to talk about. So this was for the group differences, and now we uh, come to the individual differences. Um, we looked at a correlation matrix uh, uh, to see which variables are um, correlated, significantly correlated with the convergent uh, thinking scores. And what it came out is that uh, the time uh, people spent abroad, which is one of the bilingual immersion measures, is uh, negatively uh, uh, correlated to uh, the convergent thinking scores. So the more time people spend abroad, the worse they score on the uh, uh, convergent thinking on the rat. Uh, also, we found a negative correlation with the flanker effect. But uh, so this shows that the smaller flanker effect, that means the easier people inhibit, the better scores they have on convergent thinking. And this was just a correlation and we, were, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So uh, we uh, conducted uh, uh, as a next step the hierarchical, hierarchical regression with uh, uh, non-bilingual variables, age, gender, and IQ based on the literature and based on the correlations, uh, we uh, picked uh, flanker effect and months spent abroad as the variables which we uh, included in uh, the blocks of hierarchical regression. In the first model, we uh, included uh, age, gender, uh, then IQ, flanker, and months uh, abroad. And as you can see how the model evolves, the IQ uh, contrary to uh, secondary literature doesn't, is, isn't doing much, explains just 1% of the variance, and also it's not contributing significantly to uh, uh, the overall model as revealed by the ANOVA. So uh, if we conduct uh, uh, the uh, ANOVA with IQ uh, added to the whole model, the significant level drops. Uh, so we decided to exclude this uh, variable in the second regression uh, model, which we ran after that. So the second regression model consisted of gender and age as non-linguistic variables at the first step, and in the second step, adding flanker effect and months abroad. As you can see, uh, adding the months abroad significantly improves uh, our model. It also uh, shows that uh, the change is uh, significant uh, uh, and um, in the R square, you can see that it uh, adds some 4.5%, explains 4.5% 4, 4, of the variance and the flanker effect 2.9% of the variance of the convergent thinking scores all over and above the gender and the age. So uh, if you look at the flanker effect and uh, uh, um, convergent thinking, here's a regression line. So you can see they are negatively correlated, which shows the uh, less conflict the uh, people experience uh, in uh, the less problems they experience in inhibitory control, the better they score on convergent thinking. Um, then we also uh, ran the hierarchical regression for divergent thinking. Again, in the correlation matrix, we uh, looked at the variables uh, as predicted uh, based on the literature, which might 
be correlated with divergent thinking. And from the correlations, uh, it came out that intelligence is correlated uh, the number of foreign languages, uh, the, LS, the social language use, and also language proficiency are significantly uh, correlated to divergent thinking. And we also decided to include these variables in the hierarchical regression alongside to the age, gender, and IQ. In the first hierarchical regression model, as we included all of these variables, uh, one uh, um, each at a time for each, uh, for each model, uh, we can see uh, that uh, age in this uh, uh, case doesn't uh, make significant prediction, uh, doesn't um, explain significant uh, amount of the variance of the divergent thinking and also doesn't uh, predict our uh, divergent thinking data significantly. Also, if you can see uh, the language proficiency, the like stale, uh, it doesn't improve the uh, significance after it's edit. And uh, here you can see that it explains just 1.6% of the variance, which is not uh, a significant amount of the variance uh, comparing to the previous model when it was not included. So we decided to drop these two variables in the subsequent model. And as you can see, this model uh, where uh, consists of uh, gender and IQ in the first step and then adding a number of foreign languages and language social use in the second two steps. Altogether, uh, both uh, the uh, the final model is significant. As you can see, the model improves if we add uh, the LSBQ and also it, um, uh, it uh, improves after adding the foreign language, uh, number of foreign languages as a variable. Uh, overall, these two variables explain uh, uh, six, uh, over 6% 6 of the variance in divergent thinking scores over and above the gender and IQ. Here is the regression line for social language use and divergent thinking. And uh, now we come uh, to uh, summary. Uh, so for the convergent thinking, we have seen that the size of the flanker effect did explain variance in uh, RAT, which is in line with our predictions because uh, executive functioning is important, is assumed to be important for convergent thinking. Months spent abroad was together with flanker effect a significant predictor of uh, RAT scores and explained 11% of variance over and above covariates. And code switching and uh, bilingual immersion and LT proficiency and even intelligence did not explain variance in RAT scores, which was contrary to our predictions. In terms of their divergent thinking, uh, social language use and months spent abroad were significant predictors of uh, um, divergent thinking. I'm sorry, here should be uh, um, social language use and number of foreign languages uh, speak it, sp spoken. Very significant predictors of divergent thinking and explained over 6% of the variance. Uh, language, language proficiency did not significantly improve our model uh, and uh, Neither did uh, the uh, flanker effect uh, or code switching uh, explain a significant part of our variance in divergent thinking, contrary to our predictions. So if you look at what predictions have been uh, confirmed and which not, uh, the convergent thinking, the RIT, we didn't find any group differences in terms of uh, interpreters, translators, and bilinguals. We found that uh, indicated by virtue of months spent abroad, uh, which uh, indicates uh, the involvement uh, in, uh, not in the dual language context, but rather in the, in the uh, code switching context. Uh, so we found this to uh, be in line with our predictions because the more months people spent abroad, the worse they scored on the convergent thinking. Uh, the high level of proficiency code switching and intelligent did not and performance on executive functioning, the flanker task uh, 
boss uh, and a positively associated with convergent thinking. In terms of divergent thinking, we observed opposite effect than expected for predictions, for group predictions, as uh, interpreters uh, they're the most creative on the divergent thinking task, uh, indicated by uh, the uh, language social use, which is, an, which is an index of the switching context, we observed positive association with divergent thinking, uh, but we didn't see any effects for code switching, uh, for language uh, proficiency or uh, um, flanker task. We observed, as uh, is in line with the literature, a positive uh, effect of intelligence on divergent thinking. So uh, how to explain these effects? So professionals uh, obtained higher scores in divergent thinking, which was contrary to our prediction and to contrary to only a study which has been conducted so far on this group of professional bilinguals and their creative abilities. This may be due to the fact that we expect, we base our predictions on uh, expectations that interpreters will excel in inhibitory control, which was not the case as they did not significantly differ from uh, the bilingual group. Um, um, in, interpreters also have been shown uh, to uh, have enhanced working memory as an uh, important uh, factor in improving creativity uh, scores, but we didn't measure it. So it's possible that we just didn't control for all the variables connected to uh, interpreting experience, which would explain why interpreters score better on divergent thinking. Also in Kim and Lim study, comparing interpreters, uh, uh, they were comparing interpreters to interpreting students. So maybe uh, if uh, um, we were because we were comparing them to translators and regular bilinguals. This had also my yield different results. The inhibitory control and creativity has been confirmed to be linked in uh, convergent thinking. So for convergent thinking, inhibitory control is shown to be important. Uh, the social language use is has been shown to be a significant predictor of divergent thinking which is uh, uh, maybe because, uh, as Anderson uh, uh, notes, high scores on social language use indicate high degree of switching between languages, which is typical for uh, uh, language use in for social purposes. And this also converges nicely with the conversational uh, context uh, uh, as defined by Abu Talib and Green, within which people switch a lot between languages, which poses lower demands on executive functions and which might give gains in divergence thinking. Man spent abroad is a significant predictor for convergent thinking, negatively uh, um, explaining, negatively correlated. Uh, this can be explained because uh, if uh, people spend a long time abroad, uh, this might be again linked to conversational context typical for immigrants, which according to Abu Talib and Green is often the dense code switching context. And uh, this one includes uh, lower demands on the executive uh, functions as inhibition. So this is maybe why uh, the uh, convergent thinking was negatively linked to uh, months spent abroad. Um, language proficiency did not predict divergent thinking uh, and did not significantly contribute to the model explaining the convergent thinking as measured by RAT. This is contrary to literature. Uh, we think that maybe it's because uh, our groups were, were highly proficient bilinguals, which uh, uh, is contrary to uh, the study uh, on uh, bilinguals, uh, comparing highly proficient bilingual bilinguals with bilinguals who just started to learn the second language. So it may be the effects of proficiency might apply only for uh, of the initial stages. So the uh, negative effects of, on the convergent thinking. Um, the code switching did not yield any effects in terms of uh, uh, 
the, our creativity scores controlled to literature. And we think this might be because our group were uh, only check English bilinguals and uh, code switching is not very prominent in uh, the Czech Republic among the, among the natives. So albeit there were significant differences between the groups in terms of code switching, the relative engagement in code switching might be still low and not sufficient to yield any effect, significant effects on uh, creativity. Um, post talk uh, uh, tests revealed that there is a strong negative correlations uh, between uh, L2 proficiency and code switching, which suggests that people who speak the languages on a better level have uh, uh, indicate uh, that they encounter uh, code switching in their environment less. This might be an index of um, negative attitude towards code switching among people who speak who have high command of uh, English. So uh, this is might be this might all have skewed our effects of code switching on on the uh, uh, creativity scores. So uh, just to sum up the key findings, we have found that on the uh, in terms of the group differences, the professional and bilinguals. Uh, um, significantly differ on a variety of measures from, uh, from the bilinguals without professional experience and that interpreters and translators are more alike uh, than uh, or you can say differ more from bilinguals than from each other. The measures which they uh, which is the case is are the code switching practices, the uh, home uh, L2 uh, use at home, also uh, the uh, flanker effect, but which did not yield significant results in the pairwise, and also on divergent thinking, as interpreters and translators were better on divergent thinking. Largely, these variables mentioned here did not predict creative thinking on the individual levels, which suggests to us that there are other variables which specify these groups, which are specific for the professional uh, bilinguals, but which we did not control for. And the, uh, this uh, does request further research. Inhibitory control plays a role in the convergent thinking uh, uh, as uh, it was expected uh, according to our hypotheses. So the base forward, as I already hinted a little bit, uh, we uh, uh, also collected the brain data uh, to uh, uh, also look at the neural correlates of creativity and bilingualism. This is especially valuable if you uh, take into consideration that brain data has potential to reveal differences uh, where behavioral data fail to do so. So uh, um, this might be a valuable piece of the data. We also, not all the behavioral data have been analyzed. Uh, so we are still going to uh, do that. Uh, limitation is uh, of our study is that we did not include a monolingual group to do, to compare uh, monolinguals and bilinguals, but it can be a, a possibility for the future research. Uh, also, it will be uh, beneficial uh, to uh, include a group of less proficient bilinguals and uh, more executive functioning tasks, which might have the power to distinguish the three groups studied uh, from each other in terms of their executive functioning abilities. Uh, it will be also uh, um, good to include a questionnaire on attitudes towards code switching, which might shed some light on uh, our uh, code switching results, which did not uh, predict any of the creativity measures contrary to secondary literature. Uh, at the end, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the uh, generous contribution of uh, uh, the uh, European Union's Horizon 2020 research uh, and also uh, the Czech bioimaging uh, support, uh, which we uh, gained. Uh, and uh, it was some obviously, it, was, it wouldn't be possible to conduct your research with this uh, generous uh, financing. And also I would like to mention that all these words wouldn't have been possible to do uh, individually. And uh, I would like to thank at this place to my lovely supervisors, which uh, helped me 
uh, on uh, this way through this and hopefully will continue to do so because we are not done yet. Uh, Christos Platzikas, Janine, uh, Jeffes Daller and Guillaume Thierry and also uh, um, my lab, Bilingualism in the Brain, Center for Literacy and Malingualism, Center for Integrative Neuroscience and Neurodynamics. And a big thanks goes also to the Central European Institute of Technology where all the data has been collected. Thank you very much. <laughs>